In this video, I'm going to talk about conducting a bivariate logistic regression in SPSS. And now this is just an introduction to logistic regression, so I'm not going to do every single possible sub-analysis within the logistic regression framework in SPSS. I'm going to leave some of the topics in the multiple logistic regression examples that I talk about later in the chapter. So for this bivariate logistic regression example, the dependent variable is scored on a dichotomous scale, which is dyslexia, and that is 0, 1. And we can see that there's a no, you're not dyslexic, 1 for yes, you're dyslexic, and handedness is the predictive variable here. And we have right-handers scored 0 and left-handers scored 1. And the hypothesis is that if you read the chapter, there is a possibility of an association between being left-handed and a greater probability, a disproportionate probability, greater odds of being dyslexic. So to analyze these data, you do it in the same way as a bivariate regression. You just have to choose a different option in the menu. So go into Analyze, Regression, and Binary Logistic. And Handedness, which is the independent variable, goes in the covariates box. So for some reason, SPSS calls independent variables covariates in logistic regression. Next, we would put dyslexia, which is the dependent variable, in the dependent box. Now there is an option here, categorical, that actually isn't relevant to this analysis because handedness is simply scored on a dichotomous scale. If you had something with three categories or more, you might consider making use of this window in order to help analyze the data in an insightful way. I'm not going to talk about that here because handedness is not one of those types of categorical variables. Now if you click on the Save button, there are options here, one of which is Influential Cases, and just like in Regression, you can use Cook's Distance as an indication of possibly an outlying value that's impacting the results in a substantial way. And you might recall from regression, if you have a Cook's distance value equal to 1.0 or greater, it's a possible problem. Now these options here, predicted values and residuals, are potentially very valuable. But I'm only going to talk about them in the context of the multiple logistic regression that I talk about later in the chapter. I'm keeping things here a little bit more simple because it's the first example in the chapter. Click Continue. If you click on Options, there are some good ones. You'll want classification plots just to see how well handedness is actually classifying each case in the data with respect to whether they're dyslexic or not. The Hosmer and Lemmish show goodness of fit statistic is actually useful, but only when you have independent variables scored on a continuous scale. So at least one of the independent variables in your logistic regression would have to be scored on a continuous scale in order for it to be useful. In this case here, handedness, the independent variable, is scored on a dichotomous scale, so Hosmer Lemma Show is not applicable. One option that is useful is the confidence intervals associated with the EXPB, which is actually the odds ratio in the regression analysis. So I'm also going to click on 95% confidence intervals for that. Click Continue, and of course bootstrapping is always a potentially valuable approach to estimating standard errors and p-values, but I'm not going to talk about that here. I'm just going to use the regular maximum likelihood estimation approach to estimating standard errors and p-values in this analysis. So if you click on OK, you'll get the results, and here is the output. We can see that the sample size is equal to 250, and here we've got the dependent variable coded, which is no, not dyslexic, and yes, one, is dyslexic. And then we have beginning block. These results, which is the classification table, is saying how accurately each case would be classified without any predictors whatsoever. And you can see that there's 96% correct classification in these data. And really, all that means is that this basic null hypothesis model is saying that 96% of the sample is not dyslexic. And so without any prediction whatsoever, if you just took the mean associated with these zero ones, you could derive a correct classification value. So let me just prove that to you here. If we look at the percentage of people who were dyslexic in this sample of data, so put dyslexia here, click on statistics, and click on the mean, and click continue, and we've got display frequency tables. So if I click OK, the percentage of people who are not dyslexic is equal to 
So you can see here, after the block zero null model classification accuracy, which seems high, it's basically only using the intercept to predict handedness, which is basically using just the descriptive statistic mean. And we can see that it's statistically significant with a Walt statistic of 96.960 and a one degree of freedom. And it's p less than 0 0.001. Again, you wouldn't really interpret this. This is the null model. We're really interested in this. What's the classification rate that we need to beat as a result of including another variable to the model? And here we have variables not in the equation, and we have handedness. That's the actual predictor we're interested in. So this is the null model. Just setting the stage, what do we need to beat? 96%. Now, in block one, we do get the statistics associated with the model we're, we're testing. And we can see that the chi-square value across step, block, and model is equal to 12.30. And so we would reject the null hypothesis that handedness is not predicting or helping to classify dyslexia in a significant way. So the model is a statistically significant model. We don't know much about the nature of the model. We just know that including handedness is statistically significant. Now we do have a model summary box here. And this, as I mentioned in the textbook, produces two values that are kind of similar to r squared in the regression context. I call them pseudo r squared values. And the Cox and Snell r squared is the closest to multiple r squared. And essentially implies that 4.8% of the variability in dyslexia was accounted for by the independent variable handedness. But it's not exactly the same as an ordinary least squares multiple regression r squared value, but it's close. Now, next is the Nagel Kirke r squared value, which is equal to 0.168. This will always be larger than the Cox and Snell r squared value because it's based on an adjustment that takes into consideration that the Cox and Snell often can't even have a maximum value of 1.0. So based on the distribution of the scores in your dependent and independent variables, the maximum possible for Cox and Snell might be as low as something as 0.5. And so 0.048 out of a maximum possible of 0.5 seems bigger than if it was 1.0. And so the nagel kirke r squared is basically an adjustment of, imagine if 1.0 was a possibility for Cox and Snell, what would it actually look like? And in this case, it's a pretty big jump. It's suggesting that it could be as large as 0.168. So you can kind of interpret this as 16.8% of the variance in dyslexia was accounted for by handedness if the data were distributed in such a way that an R squared value of 1.0 was even possible. So these are the two measures of effect size for the model, if you will. I don't really pay attention to the log likelihood in terms of effect size. So the next table is a classification table, which is based on the model. This is not the null model. This is actually including the predictor in the model. And you can see that prediction accuracy has stayed exactly the same, 96.0. So, so on the basis of the classification table, there's not any benefit to including handedness as a predictor in this model, which is kind of disappointing. But we're actually accounting for so little variance in the model, it just couldn't push it across the line to predict one extra case on the basis of this additional 5%-ish increase in percentage of variance accounted for. So we're stuck at 96, which implies that it's not really a very impressive model. Something to keep in mind, though, is that these data are very lopsided with respect to the frequency with which dyslexia actually occurs. In fact, dyslexia is only about 5% of this whole data set. So in fact, it's exactly 4%. So it's a very small percentage of cases that this model is trying to predict. And it's actually very tough for a statistical analysis to predict relatively infrequent occurrences. So that doesn't mean that it hasn't done anything, though. The Cox and Snell R squared is saying it's doing something 4.8%. And the model is statistically significant on the basis of this omnibus test of the model coefficient. So that implies this R squared value is statistically significant. So it's doing something, but not so much that it can predict an extra case in the data. So now here is the variables in the equation. And this is including handedness as a predictor in the model. And we can see that 
Handedness has a unstandardized beta weight of 2.574. I talk later in the textbook about how to calculate a standardized beta weight in a multiple regression context, so check that out if you're interested. Here's the standard error associated with the unstandardized beta weight. And here's the Wald statistic, which is a bit of an unusual statistic. It's not a t-value. It's not a chi-square value. It's its own thing. And it's equal to 14.30. And with one degree of freedom, that is statistically significant, p less than 0 0.001. So this unstandardized beta weight, which is positive in nature, which implies that a higher score on handedness, which in this case is equal to left-handedness, because that's what got the 1, is associated with a higher value on dyslexia, which in this case, a value of 1 was dyslexia, and not dyslexia was 0. So we have a positive slope here using regression language. So something is happening, and it's statistically significant, and so the hypothesis that left-handedness would be disproportionately represented amongst those who have dyslexia is supported here. And in fact, the odds ratio, which SPSS refers to as exponentiated b, is equal to 13.118. So there is about a 13 times greater likelihood of being diagnosed with dyslexia if a person is left-handed on the basis of these data. And the 95% confidence intervals associated with this odds ratio correspond to 3.45 and a whopping 49.8. So the confidence is really wide ranging in these data, even though we have a sample size of 250. And I suspect this is because the model is trying to predict something that's relatively infrequent. And so it doesn't have a lot of confidence in its predictive capacity, but it is statistically significant because the lower bound and the upper bound are both greater than 1.0. Now you can have, as I mentioned in the textbook, odds ratios that are less than 1.0, and those can be meaningful too, and I help you interpret those in the textbook. Typically, whether they're above 1.0 or whether they're less than 1.0, typically it's best to interpret odds ratios such that they're positive in my opinion. So if you want to flip your data around zeros and ones in your independent variable, it gives you the chance to interpret your data with odds ratios greater than 1.0. Lastly, the variables in the equation includes the intercept. So this, what SPSS refers to as the constant. So the intercept is equal to negative 3.798. So a value of y when x is 0, in this case here, so if you're a right-hander because x is the handedness variable and 0 in that case is right-handed, you would expect y to equal negative 3.798. Now that's not actually a possible value in these data, but it is supporting the idea that right-handers are less likely to be dyslexic. Overall, I don't really see a huge advantage of interpreting the constant in a bivariate logistic regression. It is useful, however, when it comes to actually building a logistic regression equation. You do need the intercept here, just like you would need the intercept in a bivariate regression. So that is a basic logistic regression, bivariate in nature, just one independent variable scored on a dichotomous scale, and a dependent variable scored on a dichotomous scale. And in this case, there does seem to be a much greater likelihood, on the basis of the odds ratio, of being diagnosed with dyslexia if a person is left-handed.